Thank you. How many of you gave up on your dream because you were afraid of a failure or rejection? I did. My dream was to become a doctor. And my fear was that I'm not good enough, so they will not accept me. So I didn't even apply. I gave up on my dream, and this wasn't because of any analytical or rational consideration. It was ruled purely by emotion, by fear, by intuition. I learned that sometimes the intuition works against us. And I also learned that dreams don't die. They push us forward in many different ways and may pop up in another time in a very different way. The fear of loss made me compromise. And, it's, and instead of, uh, of studying medicine, I found myself studying science in university. And after graduation, I spent 10 years in what I call Chapter A. Chapter A included working for Intel and later joining as an executive to a startup company. These, was, these were years with a lot of excitement and productivity and a lot of achievements that I could be very proud of. But I really felt a lack of fulfillment. I wasn't that happy. And I began to ask myself, what is it that will make me happier? And I came to the conclusion that I should explore a way to get closer to my dream. And I should step and explore the way to get closer to the medical arena. And the next time I felt as I'm, as I'm getting closer to my dream was when I met two very unique individuals. I was involved in a due diligence process of Mazor Robotics. And I met the founders, Professor Moshe Shoham and Elise Havi, that introduced to me a very intriguing idea, the smallest robot or surgical robotic system that ever been created that supposed to be able to place surgical tools and implantable devices along the spine and later on also in the brain. And I was intrigued by the technology. But more than that, I was greatly impressed by with all their reputation, the achievements, the experience of these two unique people, they were still so humble, so candid, so down to earth, and I admit, so they are, so they are the same today. They offered me to lead the organization, and I made almost an intuitive decision. I felt something so special in the air, I felt as I fall in love with them, and I decided that I'm joining them because here and now I'm getting close to my dream. And this was for me the beginning of my chapter B. And in the next few minutes, I would like to talk with you about, a little bit about a few learnings, few key learnings that I took from the years in Mazor Robotics. The first decision I made was to change the company name. I knew that the road is going to be very long. And one of the first key learnings that I want to share is setting expectations. At least in my life, there are no shortcuts. Everything is long, full of surprises. So if you know that this is the way, expect it and try to enjoy it. And the original name of the company was Masor, which is an acronym. It has been taken from one of the first papers that Professor Sean published in the IEEE journal. It stands for Miniature Apparatus for Surgical Operating Robot. We agreed to, make, to replace only one letter, the S with a Z. Masor means in Hebrew, a saw. But when you replace the S with a Z, Masor means in Hebrew, to heal. And I thought it's important. It's important because knowing that the road is, road is long and the journey is going to be full of surprises, we should keep the purpose in front of us. And by making this change, I sent a message. We are here for the purpose, not for the tool. And the road was long. I admit, much longer than what I expected. I never thought it would take us 15 years to get to where, where we are today. And along the road, I was exposed to a beautiful poem 
by the Greek poet Kawafis, The Way to Ithaca. And what really inspired me in this poem is the concept of the role of the road on your way to a desired destination. We were all, or I, been educated to focus on the objective, to focus on the goal, and to be willing to sacrifice the presence in return to the promise of the future. But I learned that I have a limited control on how will a desired destination feel, look, I, how I, will I experience it, when I will get to there, and if I will get there. But I have so much more control on the here and now. And this really inspired me to put much more attention on the here and now in management, in the organization, and in and, and at life. And the second learning has to do, based on this understanding, that if you know you're going to cross the ocean, and introducing um, a, a disruptive technology to the market has a lot to do, has a lot of similarities, like aiming to use a rowing boat to cross the ocean. And you should ask yourself with whom you want to do it. Who are the people who you want them to sit with you on the boat when you will spend the first years so much time on explaining, apologizing, finding solutions to everything that failed and you didn't expect it will happen? Who are the people that you want them to be with you on that boat? And the selectivity shouldn't be limited to your close team, to the employees of the company. You should consider your users and customers as part of your team. Because the success of developing and overcoming the challenges of introducing new technology has a lot to do with the interaction, the communication, the relationship between you and these who use your technology. So we created an analytical tool, a list of, of 12 different criteria that will help us to select who are the right customers, who are the right partners for us. And I assure you that this list was everything but intuitive. The traditional common criteria of influential academic accreditation, reputation, num number of papers, and all these were number eight, nine, and ten. And, and, uh, eight, nine, and ten in our list. The first seven focused all of them on quality of communication, constructiveness, focus on details, and being able to speak and to facilitate a healthy working environment. And I truly believe that what makes a big difference between a success de development and a failure is the ability to facilitate this kind of environment with your early adopters. I took it one step farther, and I communicated to the entire sales team of the company, you are exempt from selling our products to people who do not carry these qualities. And this is not because we didn't need the endorsement or the money of these customers. To the opposite, we were desperately needed it. But because I understood that we can't afford selling the product to the wrong customers. And this was a very provocative list, because my message was, we should, have, we should have the confidence to leave money on the table and just say, not now, maybe in the future, because of these reasons. So the process of selecting customer was a process where we combined analytics and intuition, and it worked great for us. It worked great for us because we considered the pros and the cons of what can work wrong, and we came with a solution. And this leads me to the third learning, which is, again, a little bit counterintuitive. I was educated to think positive. I was educated that perception is reality, and if I will think good, everything will be good. Unfortunately, at least in my life, not, maybe not in yours, reality not always carry the rose lenses glasses as I wish. And through this process, I learned a bit about the value of pessimism. Because by being prepared, you can facilitate a much more healthier working environment. And pessimism, I would say it may be different. You know, people don't naturally associate 
leadership with pessimism. Leaders are expected to be optimists, and leadership in many ways is the dream of what can be done. But pessimism is not popular because, number one, it's depressing, and number two, it forces all of us to work very hard in preparation to that. And because of its importance, and in spite of the fact that it's not popular, the analytical part of me made me decide to implement a mechanism in the organization, in the, in the organization that will force us to be conscious about the pessimistic scenario to be better prepared. And what I did is I assigned one of the executives and I asked him, you will be our devil advocate. And I'm asking you to challenge every optimistic scenario that we put in front the management team and challenge it. You will be the guardian of the half empty of the glass and you will force us not only to listen, not only to be conscious, but to come with solutions and mitigation plans to the nightmares that you dream on our behalf. And by doing that, I, I realized that we were able to facilitate a much healthier working environment. People felt less surprises, the level of anxiety had been reduced, we were better prepared to what will happen, what came to us. And this actually led me to another discovery, which is another one of the learnings I wanted to share, which has to do with the opportunity of well, or the, the management opportunity of using well-being experience in the organization. Reducing the level of anxiety and stress is great, but this is not necessarily all what well-being is about. I believe that well-being is a much more holistic term that has to do with the way one experiences his body, his health, his presence, how we think and behave in this world. And I believe that people who experience well-being feel so much happier, communicate better, create, are more creative, and they can facilitate such a much, so much better productive environment. My well-being is highly affected by my hobby, running. And I don't, run get, I don't run well by myself. I have a really hard time to wake up in the morning, especially in the winter, if I need to run for myself. So a few years ago, I joined a running group. And I learned to appreciate the role and the power of the group on my well-being. There is someone there waiting for me. And we run together so much better. And I began to ask myself, how could I offer this experience of well-being to my team? How could I leverage the, gr the different groups in the organization in order to facilitate an environment that will help us to offer this experience of well-being and good feeling to the team? I decided to hire a person that her, her role was, or is, to be the organizational well-being manager. Not a very common position. And I asked her to spend time with me and to develop a comprehensive plan that will facilitate this type of culture in the organization. I wanted us to be mindful to the boundaries between the home, the community, and the office. We didn't want to diminish these boundaries. But, and, and I also wanted to be sensitive. I didn't want, to, I didn't want us to take ownership on the well-being of the employees. What I wanted is to facilitate a culture that will encourage people to take ownership and to do it with their families, at their communities, and when possible, also at, office, at the office. We introduced this plan about two years ago, and the results are far beyond all what I expected. The level of engagement, the happiness, the, the way people communicate, the willingness to share knowledge and information between different groups in the organization, a lot of different positive results came out from this plan. People stay in the organization not because, or not only because they are fairly paid, but also because 
they want to be associated with an organization that takes care of them and takes sincere care of how they feel. And I truly believe that the well-being program had a, had a very important role in the success of the company. And our technology shown success around the world. Our miniature robotic system is used today in four different continents. Hundreds of surgeons are able and, and proud to offer reliable and reproducible spine surgery with our technology. There are thousands of patients that have been operated and grateful for being get, get, uh, benefiting from the benefits of surgical robotics. We have the system been um, uh, involved in placing close to 100,000 implants in the spine of human, uh, human beings and recently also in the brain. We estimate that without our system, about 6,000 of these implants were to be misplaced. About 800 would, need, would, would suffer from complications and about 350 patients would suffer from severe complications, revision surgeries, and carry disabilities for the rest of their life. We made a difference with what we developed. As I said in the beginning, dreams don't die. They do push us forward in different ways. And in my case, I feel that I do touch life of many people through what I do. If you would ask me where we are heading and what will the future bring, I will reverse the question to you, and I will ask you to try to imagine how do you imagine the operating theater in 30, 40, 50 years from today? Do you see a lot of robotics technology there? I trust most of you do. Do you think that robots will replace the surgeons? Do you see a surgeon in the room? I do. I think it's critically important to remember that while robots will become dominant in the operating theater, they will never replace the surgeon. Because intuition and compassion and care are essential for the heal. And robots can fix, but they cannot heal. And the robot can replace the hands, but they cannot replace the spirit, the care, and the heart of these who care of us. Thank you.